Chris Gorfinkel. Dr. Gorfinkel is a family physician who has participated in over 60 clinical trials with a special interest in vaccination research. She helped co-author seminal papers on Shingrix and has sat as a co-chair on the Shingrix Advisory Board. Welcome, Iris. I'm really having trouble saying Shingrix today. Shingrix. Oh. <laughs> Many thanks for having me back, Natasha. It's always a pleasure. It is. I, I really appreciate our conversations. And, and as I said earlier with Dr. Who, you'll be staying with us for, for this session and then for some more questions on COVID. So we'll be spending some time together. Fantastic. So, before we talk about COVID, though, I want to talk to you more about pneumonia and shingles. So my first question is, what are the vaccines that people should think about after they turn 50? There's a whole list of them. And frankly, there's a lot of competition in the space when you go to a family doctor. So I'd suggest making an appointment specifically to talk about this. So most people are familiar with influenza. You need that every year, but what's forgotten? Mm -hmm. Pertussis, remember that? Whooping cough? Well, guess what? There's close to 3,000 cases in a bad year in Canada. Anywhere between one and 3,000 cases can break a rib. It's so bad, it starts out as a cold and turns into a horrible cough. So that's once in a lifetime. Of course, tetanus is every 10 years. So this is a, this is a whole appointment, actually. And then we talked about pneumococcal vaccinations. That's against pneumonia. And there's actually two floating around. One is called Prevnar 13, which is recommended to get first. And eight weeks later, the Pneumovax 23, that's what's recommended. And then of course, shingles vaccine is on that list. It's quite a long list of vaccines, but once they're checked off, they're done and you don't have to keep thinking about it. Then if for travelers, hepatitis A and B, that's for most of the world. And of course, typhoid fever as well is on that list. Great, and so when we look at the shingles vaccine, what is the efficacy of it? And how long are you protected for after you get the shingles vaccine? Shingles vaccine was called, like this trials that, that looked at that, of which I was a part, mm -hmm. was, was called the best trial in the past 10 years. That's how robust this data was. And I still remember when they made the announcement, it was 97% effective in reducing disease. That's tremendous. That's an individual's under the age of 69. When you're talking about over that age, it's still over 90% efficacy, some 91%. And what's exciting is that it not only reduces a common disease, it also reduces the result of that common disease, which is damage to the nerve called post-herpetic neuralgia. And that affects a large number of individuals who experience that. And so you have a about a 90% reduction to the neuralgia that can come with having had shingles. So you, you call um, shingles a common disease. So how common actually is it? Like what are, your, what are your chances of getting it once you've turned 50? You know, it's interesting. The lifetime risk is one in three. So as people age, they're more likely to get this disease. So it is to say that it's common. It's the, what the vaccine does is it takes a common event and turns it into a rare event. That's why it was called one of the best research trials in the last decade, because it is taking such a common thing. And what are the chances that increase that? This is interesting. Physical and psychological stress both can increase the risk. And you know, we've heard these risk factors before. They're the very same as with COVID that entire list of common, you know, chronic conditions, especially those that immunosuppress. Things like diabetes, that's an immunosuppressive condition. You know, so it is important to get that vaccine on board. The problem is we've got spotty coverage. I think you were talking about that a bit earlier, and it's a pity. It is an expensive vaccine and not every province will cover it. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, that's interesting to know. And so is there an age where the, the shingles vaccine isn't as effective? Uh, so is there sort of a drop-off age where it, it doesn't matter if you get it or not? This is a vaccine which is effective at all ages. You know, the efficacy does drop in the very older patient, you know, so it, but it doesn't drop by a lot, you know, so it drops by about seven to eight percent. So it goes from 97 percent to about 90 percent. But it's still important to get because it's the best we've got which is to say it will take a common disease, a common event, one in three lifetime risk, and make it into a rare event. So that's why, you know, I try to get all my patients 
to be vaccinated against that. Really, there's no excuse to have disease when we have such a vaccination in our armamentarium. And that's a good way of putting it. You're getting vaccinated so you can turn a common event into a rare event. So I, I like and we can say the things. same thing yeah. for pneumococcal disease, for sure. right? You know, you know, so there's no reason why one should have pneumonias. Now, true, people can get pneumonias for other reasons. There's viral pneumonia, there's even fungal pneumonia. But I think the key messaging here is this. Once a person has a pre-existing lung condition, I don't, you know, whatever it is, it could be asthma, it could be a smoker's lung, that's hugely important. COPD, emphysema, all these things, they set the stage for other diseases. So once somebody has one underlying lung condition, they are on board for getting multiple other lung conditions. We heard the same song being sung when it came to COVID-19. It's the very same thing. You got a chronic heart condition? Well, guess what? The heart lives right next to the lungs. They're like this. So it is critical to be vaccinated. And so does shingles only affect you if you've had chicken pox or not had chicken pox in the past? I always get confused between the two. So what is yeah, the link? So what yeah, what shingles is, is a reactivation of the chicken pox virus. It's incredible. The virus can stay dormant literally for decades. And for some individuals, you know, the, the virus, it's, it's, like, it's like a seed in planet Earth that only comes out eight to nine decades after. It can be a number of years, but the virus reactivates and it travels down the nerve root. And as it does, it's causing damage. That's the problem. You know, so we can vaccinate to prevent that from happening. You know, but yes, it is common, more common as people get older because of a depressing thing called immunosenescence, which we heard also for COVID-19. Our immune system just isn't as robust at recognizing and preventing these diseases from happening as time goes on. So I have an audience question. So Maureen from Aurelia asks, I had the original shingle shot. Since then, there is a newer updated shot. Is it necessary for me to get this shot or am I still protected with the older version? You do have protection from the older version, but the recommendation across the board, no matter where you live, in Europe, in the United States, and in Canada, is get Shingrix. So if you have the old shot, Zostavax, it's just that it's less effective and it falls off with efficacy over time. So that's why everyone is still advised to get Shingrix, even if they've had sh Zostavax. Okay, and so if you've actually had shingles but have not been vaccinated, how long should you wait after you've had shingles to then get vaccinated? Great question. I get this all the time. So the lifetime risk, if somebody's had shingles, of getting it a second time sits at about 20%. So one in five individuals will still get it. You're not out of the woods. So there is not an exact time frame in Canada. It's about one year. That's generally what we wait here. However, if you're living in the U.S., it can be given almost right away. Some say two months. But my, my thing is, like, I just try not to find an excuse not to give it. I just try to get it on board because I think that's the more important thing. But generally speaking, there will be immunity after someone has had it. But the immunity does not last a lifetime. So I would say a year is very reasonable. And so switching gears a little bit from shingles to the pneumococcal vaccine, who should get the pneumococcal vaccine? Yeah, so it, this is a complex question actually, because this is not a one size fits all. Right. If somebody has any degree of immunosuppression, it should always be a consideration. And incidentally, the same is true for Shingrix. So if somebody is really immunosuppressed, Health Canada has already approved it for individuals 18 and over. So pneumococcal disease, like these, these diseases strike when the iron is hot, when people are, are less, you know, are more vulnerable to it. And immunosuppression sets that stage. What about chronic liver disease? You know, severe obesity. Like these are all risk factors and the government actually does cover individuals to get vaccinated when they have these conditions, even at a younger age. But if you're just the average Joe with the average weight with average, no medical history and basically healthy, it's over 65. And what's recommended is you get one dose of Prevnar and then eight weeks later, you get the pneumovax vaccination. So those are the two pneumococcal vaccines. So there's Prevnar and... Pneumo, 
Pneumovax 23. Pneumovax. You don't have to know this. Pneumovax. I might have to know this one day. It might be a question on a trivia game or something. So those are the two vaccines. So you just said you get one, and then the second one you get eight weeks later. Yes, that's correct. Now, what if you already had Pneumovax? Then you're supposed to, weirdly enough, wait a year before you get the Prevnar 13. Okay. But your doctor can, like a person's doctor, can look at the vaccines. The key is, the key message, you know, get these boxes checked off your health care right. list. This is low-lying fruit. Vaccination makes a lot of sense. Governments are covering it, generally speaking. And even if they're not covering it 100%, it's worth the out-of-pocket payment to make sure that you don't have a disease that's actually preventable through vaccination. And once they're checked off, you don't have to keep coming back to them. It's true. So certainly the key message that from our talk so far is talk to your doctor, see what vaccines you need, and get them. It seems like pretty simple advice. I, I do want to go back to one of the things you had talked about. So when you talked about the Shingrix clinical trials, you said they were seen as one of the ro most robust uh, clinical trials ever. And so I'm not sure how familiar you, you are with the COVID-19 vaccine clinical trials, but in terms of being robust, like what is your opinion? Do you think, because you hear a lot of talk about the COVID-19 clinical trials not being very good, whatever that means. So as, as an actual health professional, what is your opinion on that statement? They're very different vaccination trials. So you look at COVID-19, that was done at a time in which the world was in an emergency situation. The world was suffering a pandemic. We had to have data and we had to have data very fast and furious. So basically we were comparing the risks after about a year with those trials versus shingles vaccine. Those trials took four years to complete. And that's pretty typical of vaccination trials. You know, and generally speaking, you know, that, that's what made that data so robust. We had four years of data. And then on top of it, we're, those trials are still continuing on now to try to better understand just how long the immunity will last. So it's funny, I, I, I'm a part of those trials and we are aging along with the, the kind volunteers who, who were in that trial. It's, it's amazing. But those original trials that Pfizer and Moderna are doing, they're still ongoing as well. Right. People don't realize that they're still happening. But they had emergency use authorization early on because of the world pandemic. Of course. Well, thank you. That, that helped clear things up. So we have a question from our YouTube live feed. So Andy asks, I've had two relatives who were not vaccinated against shingles who then got the COVID-19 vaccine and got shingles right after. So is there any connection or is this something you've, you've heard of or is it more of an anecdote? That's an anecdote, but you know, we have to look at big data to direct things. Mm -hmm. Bad things often happen and they can happen randomly. So the only way to really understand that space is to compare how many people who had a placebo versus how many people had the active vaccine. That said, Getting a vaccine is not always easy for people. Some people are going to get systemic side effects like headache, muscle aches, joint pain. You know, so there is a bit of a challenge to the immune system. But does that mean they're more likely to get other diseases during that time? That takes a trial to really understand that space. You know, so I can also tell you about patients who got the vaccine and were crying with joy because they knew they weren't going to get the disease or their likelihood was far less. So what do you do with the one off? It's hard to know. I mean, you have to look at that in terms of big data. And there has been no trials which have shown an increased risk of shingles after getting vaccinated to COVID, to my knowledge. OK, well, that, that does help. And for my last question to you, and this is something I've been asking most of our guests today, how do you combat vaccine hesitancy in your own life if, there, if there's someone, be it a patient or, or a loved one, who, who has questions and isn't sure and doesn't really want to get it because of what they're hearing? How do you combat that? You know, I try hard to understand the space. It's, it's been an interesting evolution in my own life because at one time I was like, there's the door. That's not what I do now. I'm just saying, like, I really was hard-lined about it because the data seems so clear to me. Right. But the fact of the matter is people bring on all kinds of reasons and stories. And I think my job is better to understand what they are so that I can meet them and, and, and try to talk to them about what the factors are that make them hesitate. So that's one aspect. Another aspect for so many people is just a matter of access. Get it to them 
make it easy to access, and boom, they get it. You know, a lot of people are worried about side effects, you know, so we can talk about the short-term side effects. But you were mentioning, what about those year, years later or something popping up? The vast majority of side effects in clinical research are picked up within those three months of having gotten the vaccine. Yeah. So could there be something else in minor? Well, we know COVID-19 up front causes very significant, very serious harms. So those harms cannot be underestimated. 